Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Kidney Coach YouTube channel. I am naturopathic practitioner Fiona Chin, co-founder of the Kidney Coach, Kidney Disease Solution, and Chiogenesis, which are our products. And I am joined today again by a very distinguished uh, uh, doctor, and that is Dr. Alex Grinberg. Alex, thank you again for joining us. So Dr. Grimberg is a very distinguished medical professional. Uh, he trained, um, he started his medical training when he was 16. So I call him a bit of a savant back in Moscow. And he completed three years of his PhD program in clinical immunology. He's got over three decades of experience in medicine. And I think what I really appreciate about Dr. Grimberg's knowledge is that he has got all of this amazing knowledge when it comes to the latest technologies coming out, biotech, um, and their advances in medicine, and then how to stack that along with things like longevity, peptide medicine, to really add to what um, Western medicine can offer us and then really take that to the next level by really staying on the cutting edge. So he works in clinical practice. He works with patients. I'm sending him my very complicated cancer patients all the time because he's got such a good amount of knowledge around that and all the, like I say, the latest technology that's coming out. So Dr. Grimberg, thank you again for joining us. I always appreciate your time, knowledge and expertise. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? I know you are uh, really on the cutting edge when it comes to medicine. Is there anything I missed in my introduction of you? Uh, Fiona, thank you so much for your warm welcome and excellent introduction. And thank you for letting me participate and uh, 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 join your program. So I will be happy to answer the questions you have for me today. Perfect. Well, today, what I really want to talk about and the reason that I really wanted Dr. Grimberg on this um, podcast is I want to talk about the sort of nine, 10, um, some people say there's 12, but I've sort of got nine or 10 of them, uh, signs of aging and what happens as we age and how that relates to the onset of chronic disease, whether that be things like neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's that we're seeing increasing in our Western world, but of course, kidney disease, uh, very much a disease of aging. And one of the things I will definitely get you to talk to Dr. Grimberg, which I get asked about all the time is, and maybe we can just start with this comment is, patients will say to me, but your kidney function will normally decline as you age. It's normal to see EGFR drop as we get older. And I'm like, no, it's not. Your EGFR should not drop as it get, as you get older. My you know, dad was 77 when he passed away with, with cancer with perfect EGFR. So I find that a funny comment, but what we're going to talk about and the signs of aging are one of the reasons that physicians will talk about that and why kidney disease can be a disease of age. So Firstly, talk to me about, is this true? Should your kidney function decline as you get older? Uh, not necessarily. And I agree, based on my clinical experience, I see very elderly people, centenarians and over, and uh, some of them have perfect uh, glomerular filtration rate and other kidney-related parameters. So... <laughs> Thank you for clearing that one up because it is one that people are like, no, but your kidney function should decline. I'm like, no. We really want to talk to the um, to this. This is what one of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for, images that I like when it comes to understanding the changes that happen in the body and the things that contribute to aging. And these are the big main ones. I'd say oxidative damage is missing from there. And Dr. Grimberg, please add any if we're missing them. But these are all things that happen basically as we age and that contribute to our chronic diseases, like I said, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease and kidney disease. And what I'd love for you to do is sort of walk us through each of these how it relates to chronic disease and is there anything we can do about these because longevity and anti-aging medicine is really your big area of interest and expertise and then how that relates to certain chronic diseases so walk me through these and is there anything that we can do uh, is there hope for us not to age so quickly first of course uh, there is always everything we can do that's that's what is the most important thing good well i'm that's so glad to hear <laughs> And uh, as we got a lot of our, our plate today, I will start like a rapid fire, uh, commenting on uh, all of them and giving some 
actionable, hopefully actionable knowledge so people can benefit from it. So epigenetic factors, so it's uh, it's a lifestyle, it's uh, uh, what we eat, what we drink, uh, what level of uh, different radiation we expose to from uh, cell phones to uh, cosmic radiation and solar flares and uh, um, electromagnetic radiation. And so uh, a simple example when you ask me first about if uh, as people age, they have necessarily have a decrease in their kidney functional uh, uh, functionality and uh, kidney function. Uh, this is mostly uh, for huge statistics, it's epigenetics. It's not kidney themselves or their cells, it's just exposure. For example, it was uh, scientifically proven that people who work in hot, hot climate in the field, dehydrate, exposed to significant dehydration, uh, they frequently develop chronic kidney disease because they have chronic dehydration. So this is clear indication how simple epigenetic and easily, uh, easily uh, changeable factor like dehydration can influence kidney. Second, amount of electrolytes and other uh, elements in the nutrition. It's uh, overwhelming kidney with phosphorus is uh, not a good factor. So uh, epigenetic factor is uh, consuming too much uh, plant-based protein, consuming too much other foods that contain high phosphorus. People can check uh, what uh, foods has uh, have a uh, high amount of phosphorus and also too much potassium. And also as people age, they uh, more likely to take more medications they, that they take for different conditions. So uh, it uh, also builds up if people take Tylenol once, it's one thing, but they have it take it uh, almost daily for a decade, it already affects kidney function and uh, taxes mm -hmm. the kidney. So that's uh, very simple. So basically any epigenetic factor, any influence that we know as uh, harmful, be it smoking or drinking or consuming too much sugar uh, or getting this uh, plastics uh, related compounds in the food or other pollution, they all affect kidney as we mentioned before kidney uh, gets major load as uh, detoxifying and filtering the blood. So definitely, if you want to say filter in some equipment, you uh, you care about it and try to avoid the overwhelming with certain substances. So this is a simple uh, influence that every one of us, uh, healthy people or people who have uh, some kidney problems can avoid and even reverse kidney damage, for example, if they improve uh, hydration, if they reduce toxic load from medications. So uh, even supplements, many supplements are, are questionable when we talk about kidney health, they may help us uh, uh, improve, say, testosterone level or help to lose weight, but at the same time where they can be very toxic for kidney. And I advise people always check nephrologist opinion about certain taking certain supplement and even mm -hmm. supplements that may be uh, supportive of kidney in low amounts cannot be supportive in high amounts so it's all depends and also in general supplement market is very indiscreet they just uh, give you cranberry and say it's good for kidney but it's good for key for what just to reduce inflammatory condition microbial invasion or for someone with specific form of glomerulonephritis, it's it's very different story. So yeah, while such things as cranberry or uh, something simple can be good for people who have UTI, it may not be good for people who have problems with high creatinine level, for example, or mm -hmm. diuretics or something else. So this is very complex here. I will not get into the intricacies of this, but. Uh, People have to be alert and check everything they take, uh, be it supplement or medication. Uh, just uh, use Google and check, let's say, uh, Tylenol and kidney function, Tylenol for people who have kidney problems. And you get more information than you get on supplement battle for sure. Yeah, I agree. And this okay. is a simple intervention that probably will help to prevent many people from getting kidney problems because even taking even simple things like taking vitamins B or D. Uh, if you look at the supplements, uh, you see on the bottles, it has 
thousand percentage of daily recommended amount of uh, two thousand. And if you check nef uh, nephrological articles, too much vitamin B, any of vitamin B may be damaging for kidney. Too much vitamin D can cause calcification of small blood vessels. Uh, that's very dangerous, and uh, it can also aggravate uh, uh, people uh, condition of people who have kidney stones. So uh, that's very important to consider. So this is basically I touch base about epigenetic factors and simple things how to mitigate this uh, potentially very damaging influences, and when you are able to avoid them or reverse somehow the effect. Uh, you may have uh, you may uh, save your kidney and you can reverse to some degree something that was caused by this factor. Yeah, it's really important. I think epigenetics is probably the thing we have the greatest amount of control over when it comes to looking into our kidneys. But if we move on to something like telomere erosion, first off, why don't you tell everybody what telomere erosion actually means? and how that relates to aging. Is it something that will happen to everybody? What sets us up for that? And then what can we do to look after our little telomeres? Uh, thank you. So basically telomeres are small cups. They consist of nucleotides at the ends of chromosomes and uh, uh, their length uh, gradually decreases with each cell division. So obviously uh, it's... Uh, uh their potential is not unlimited and uh, uh different factors affect how fast telomeres are shortening and good uh, good thing is that it's also reversible and uh you can extend the lengths of shortened telomeres with different things ranging from simple epigenetic i would say epigenetic back to epigenetics influences like uh, uh, reducing stress reducing unwanted negative emotions, uh, meditating, uh, uh, doing breathing exercises, and of course, uh, watching uh, the diet and uh, uh, cutting on uh, harmful habits. But at the same time, there are more complex things that uh, proven to increase telomere lengths, ranging from uh, uh, gene therapy, interventions, uh, peptides, uh, taking supplements, and uh, uh, I will uh, uh, talk briefly about each of them. So in gene therapy, uh, for about last uh, two decades, there were attempts to uh, deliver uh, genes that uh, interfere with expression of genes regulating te uh, telomerase. So to simply explain it, there is an enzyme that is responsible for uh, elongating telomeres. So you can affect this enzyme by uh, adding or editing genes that are responsible for production of this enzyme. And uh, this uh, gene therapy um, usually utilizes some uh, uh, mild and uh, let's say harmless, as harmless as it can be a virus that will deliver this uh, piece of genetic information to individual uh, genome and hopefully will work this way, uh, stimulating uh, telomerase to elongate telomeres. And uh, uh, peptides uh, also uh, very uh, uh, doing good job in this area. Like epithalone is the first peptide identified mm -hmm. and uh, tested many times and uh, proven that uh, it extends telomere lengths. And obviously, uh, across uh, many different uh, cell types and tissues, although probably it should be further studied. And uh, uh, potentially some other peptides may elongate telomeres directly or indirectly. For example, we'll uh, discuss soon mitochondrial dysfunction, and it should be mentioned that telomere lengths and mitochondrial ad attrition appear to be interrelated and uh, definitely as every process in our body needs energy uh, uh, rebuilding our telomeres also requires energy and mitochondria are energy station and a uh, significant part of the energy is consumed to uh, reverse or uh, restore telomere uh, morphology and function and for the same reason uh, 
NAD plus injections that became popular. Mm. Uh, the, some scientists saying that 80% of uh, NAD is consumed uh, for energy to elongate telomeres. Uh, so, 80%? Uh, I didn't know it was that high. That's amazing. Yes, yes. I, I heard of this in a recent uh, A4M conference, but uh, it's also science in progress and definitely, obviously, uh, I uh, believe it depends on uh, uniqueness of every individual genome, how many percents of NID goes for telomere elongation and what genes are activated because it's not one group of genes, it's complex of different uh, mechanisms and processes that uh, regulate this. And it's not only telomere lengths, it's, uh, you know, as, uh, it's well known that sometimes when telomere length is uh, uh, more than normal, it uh, triggers other pathological processes. It's also uh, telomeres, functional health, obviously, uh, I would speculate it's how fast they're able to rebuild themselves and uh, how correctly they, because uh, they all consist from uh, nucleotides, so it's also genetic informa information material, how they're able to rebuild themselves without letting any mutations, even small one happen there. So, so many things important uh, to maintain the length and structure. And it's like, telomere length is extremely important in uh, kidney health. As recently, uh, due to uh, COVID pandemic, a lot of as virology is closely interrelated with genetics, uh, it was noticed that uh, after viral infection, uh, telomere lengths and uh, uh, kidney cells were also studied. There was shortening of telomere lengths post COVID infection. And obviously, like long right? COVID, yeah, yeah. And uh, I've seen some of my patients who did very well and uh, whose kidney function was restored to normal, almost normal, is peptides and other interventions after they got COVID. And unfortunately, sometimes after they got vaccination, uh, they their symptoms worsen. Mm. Yeah, I saw the same thing. And I guess telomere erosion, DNA damage and mitochondrial function are all related. Do you want to let people know why the length of the telomere cap on the end of the DNA and chromosomes is so important and what that um, role of tel telomeres and the capping is and what it provides to DNA? Uh, are they... Uh... Again, it's uh, oversimplification, but they're important because they are uh, uh, cellular division is very complexly regulated process. And uh, participation of telomeres and regulating this process is uh, basically um, is uh, one of the most important factors in uh, uh, cell division. and. Uh, uh, cell division and different stages of cell division and uh, sometimes arrest that the stopping in certain stage of cell division, uh, that's what uh, actually uh, makes a difference between normal cell and cancer cell, one of the yeah. main factors. So uh, as uh, um, there is a very thin line between uh, some uh, deviation in normal cell division and helping the cell proceed in the normal healthy cell line, uh, changing as little as possible with each consequent division, following division, or turning into mutated or even senescent or malignant cells. So for this reason, uh, certain, uh, when telomere length drops under a certain uh, limit, uh, this cell unable to function normally and uh, start pathway to senescence. Yeah, and and eventually apoptosis. That's uh, that means cells death, aging and death of the cell itself. Yeah. So maintaining normal lengths of telomeres, we can maintain normal division, and uh, the less uh, mutated and the less changes the uh, daughter cell from uh, mother cell, uh, the better. Uh, whole body and entire organism is because the cells remain healthy and as close to the useful state as possible. Yeah. 
I, yeah, exactly. I always think about how it, they sort of cap the end of the cells to make sure that they're dividing in a healthy healthy way rather than an unhealthy sick way. And I guess that goes right into DNA damage. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to the damage of DNA and how that relates to kidney disease and aging and chronic disease or whether we've covered it. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. That's good. Uh, thank you, Fiona. So actually there is a smooth transition between telomere eros erosion and DNA damage. And I wanted to add that other than uh, this uh, experimental uh, means of gene therapy and less experimental interventions using peptides, there are also some simple supplements that uh, obviously contribute into telomere uh, health. Uh, Well-known one is astragalus, but astragalus is a, a very widely known and traditional Chinese medicine mm -hmm. uh, plant. Uh, but uh, to actually influence the telomere length, you need to extract a very high amount of uh, uh, one of the ingredients that is uh, in astragalus, uh, very, with very complex name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I know the one. <laughs> so the total yield of this substance from astragalus is, uh, is very low, and it requires almost pharmaceutical grade technology to extract it. So I don't recommend people to consume a lot of astragalus because so people particularly with certain kidney conditions and maybe counterproductive. But uh, uh, you can Google what companies now extract this ingredient from astragalus that helps with telomere health. And uh, uh, I was reviewing many articles and uh, they do show scientifically proven increase of telomere lengths two to three folds. So mm -hmm. uh, rebuilding telomeres activity two to three four. Actually, they measure increasing telomerase activity. Also, they compared this to uh, uh, to another plant. Uh, it's called uh, I think Camellia sinensis. It's uh, Gotocola. 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 Centella. Yeah. And it's Cent Centinella Asi asiatica, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it showed three to four folds increase in telomerase activity. Uh, but this uh, supplement may also have some dose limiting factor. It may not be so safe for liver. So again, uh, and this information is given for people to understand that certain plants are nature given and can help us in uh, this area. But again, discretion, discretion, and discretion, particularly for people with chronic conditions. And uh, so that leads us to next question, DNA damage. Uh, as we were discussing telomere erosion, uh, everything is related to DNA and uh, chromosomes consist of DNA so as well as telomeres. So uh, things that damage telomeres definitely damage DNA, but uh, DNA is a pretty resilient uh, structure and has a lot of trouble shooting, shooting mechanisms. But still, <laughs> and unfortunately, people uh, uh, do everything to overwhelm these mechanisms. And uh, people and viruses, and uh, they create so many distractions. So for example, uh, uh, first uh, I have to say why DNA damage is dangerous. Uh, so DNA is cod coding uh, genetical information. And in chemical level, it means it uh, codes proteins that have to be synthesized by the cells to maintain our life. So any change in the in the code of DNA uh, translates into the changes in protein structures and changes in protein structures translate into the actually the names of the illnesses. It's for any illness, the, almost for any illness, you can find some uh, pathological protein. Mm -hmm. For example, tau protein in Alzheimer's disease, uh, and uh, very well known example and um, so uh, we want to avoid this happen and uh, dna itself has a lot of uh, self repairing and uh, 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 as i said troubleshooting mechanisms built in uh, but unfortunately uh, all uh, toxic influence like uh, there are exotoxins and endotoxins Exotoxins, obviously, uh, environmental pollutions and uh, 
everything that we can uh, get externally, but endotoxins are uh, uh, things that our body, our cells produce. And here, uh, such unwanted process as inflammation is a big source of endotoxins. These endotoxins uh, block normal function and energy production in mitochondria. They reduce receptor sensitivity to insulin and among many other things I just gave couple of examples for people to understand how important that is. And that uh, starts cas cascade or chain of reactions that eventually translates inside the cell and then the space around DNA affects the microenvironment that interferes with uh, very subtle chemical processes that are needed for DNA cell restoration. This is one thing then, of course, viruses and not only very well-known aggressive viruses that uh, we hear in the news about, but also latent viruses like cytomegalovirus, herpes, Epstein-Barr virus, HPV. Uh, it's uh, uh, bro wildly no broadly known viruses, but there are so many of them, uh, hundreds of them that are not so well known and they can quietly uh, live in our genome. And uh, there are also dormant viruses that's been there for maybe uh, since the beginning of human race. Mm. And usually they dormant, but uh, under some uh, conditions that are obviously beneficial for them, but not for human, and they can uh, drop from one genetic uh, location to another and pull the piece of uh, unwanted gene there. And this combination can trigger major destructions in uh, transcription of DNA. And uh, usually uh, it uh, leads to oncogenesis. So it's very dangerous and uh, unwanted event. And what can be done to prevent this? Uh, 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 certain simple things are certain supplements that uh, reduce viral, may reduce viral load and have good reputation to fight viruses, obviously. Uh, many uh, doctors uh, recommend uh, ozone therapy that obviously has many benefits, but again, uh, for people with chronic kidney condition, uh, should be taken very carefully because uh, initial effect is oxidation and for short time producing more free radicals. And I'm not sure how we can measure how this particular person, patient, kidney cell functionality can deal with this overwhelming load of uh, free radicals, ROS, NOS, for at least short period of time. So should be taken in a very good consideration of recent benefits. And uh, uh, IV laser radiation obviously helps to stimulate immune system in a certain way against viruses. Then there are cell uh, medicine interventions uh, like proliferating and reinfusing NK cells, so deri deriving exosomes from them and using them. But NK cells actually attack and destroy cells uh, that are infected by the virus. So to, they are not so, uh, good players for inside the cell and DNA is inside the cell. But at least to reduce viral load in the body, they can help. So yeah. other things obvious, obviously, uh, there is developing science of using exosomes and mm -hmm. some scientists believe that uh, exosomes are uh, particularly important because they bring uh, uh, s uh, slicing factors, the factors that help DNA double spiral to uh, to separate into single spi uh, single uh, spiral single spirals this is more contributive to normal transcription and reduces rate of mutations, and it's very important. So you see things like this. Uh, the process of DNA self-reparation is so complex that can be affected from different uh, scientific fields, from nanotechnology, from uh, molecular biology, from pharmacology. So it's very developing field, but again, uh, even from what I said, uh, you can feel optimistic that there are simple and more complex measures and uh, risk mitigations and even treatment that can be taken. 
And what about methylin blue? Because that's something I use for viral infections that I've found for myself has been really very good. They were working with mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, let's mention this because peptides are very good. And this is my experience. Uh, my patients uh, benefit very well from short courses of LL37. Peptides yep. in combination, depending on uh, the other conditions, I frequently combine it with thymosine alpha-1. Uh, mm -hmm. For other people who have some uh, 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 where I have concerns about the level of inflammation or autoimmunity, instead of thymosine alpha-1, I use uh, thymoline or, or vylon. And I mm -hmm. also definitely stimulating mitochondrial function helps cells to get rid uh, to deal with viruses because again uh, one of the most active uh, systems let's like as our special forces uh, immune system and they have very mobile cells and uh, obviously they need to consume a lot of energy even for such simple process as phagocytosis or bacteria and uh, relatively huge organisms compared compared to viruses but still even deal with them, they need a lot of energy uh, to help cells to move there, to turn on the chemical synthesis of digestive enzymes. So, and all of this uh, supplied by energy from mitochondria. So definitely uh, using uh, peptides that uh, support mitochondria like MOTSC, humanine, and yeah. uh, uh, SS31 that also supports many other kidney functions and re reducing uh, by all means lipid peroxidation or bringing this, uh, it's actually <laughs> uh, probably next topic for next nutrient signaling dysfunction, but they all interconnect that you can't take without another that's our bodies are so complex and so many levels and uh, degrees of complexity of interaction between them. Yeah. And and methylene blue, is that something you use a lot of? Because that's something I get good results in for viral, uh, removing viruses and obviously protecting mitochondrial dysfunction as well and stacked with peptides. Yes, definitely, definitely. Methylene blue, uh, blue and but again, in, uh, for people with chronic kidney conditions, uh, it, uh, I would recommend, uh, if, uh, actually there is a simple way uh, for testing that uh, common sense based. For example, I would recommend people before they do metal and blue or ozone therapy to have basic uh, renal panel mm -hmm. and uh, then to repeat this in a few days after the, uh, either next day or in a few days after the procedure is performed. And uh, actually there is also safe uh, modality of treatment, uh, uh, hydrogen is uh, mm -hmm. what uh, people call molecular or uh, nanohydrogen. If it's a reliable and reputable source of this product, it also gets very well inside the cells and hopefully may stimulate some antiviral activity. I, uh, I'm familiar with reports about antibacterial activity, but uh, I don't know yet about antiviral. But uh, I suspect that it may help there as well. Yeah, the hydrogen water, is, it's meant to be very highly anti-inflammatory. I know there was a study, I think the Cuberman Labs was talking about it, where they did hydrogen water every day for 14 days and the inflammatory levels massively dropped. So, yeah, that definitely helps get inside the cell. Well, actually, and actually, I have to mention uh, bioma, bioma and bioma. It's a microbioma. It's... Definitely, we need to make sure that our bacteria there or other organisms are friendly and produce only kidney-friendly mm. products of their life. And many of them produce peptides. And uh, definitely, a lot of attention was paid to Akermanzia. But other, I hope uh, with AI development that uh, the testing will be accelerated and we can find out or peptides or other useful or otherwise uh, products uh, many of our biome-based organisms producing. So this, but the general strategy is to bring it to in good order. <laughs> yes. Well, testing and companies and using the science that is available now. It contributes to mitochondrial health. It reduces endotoxins and uh, 
inflam inflammatory signaling so many things but but then definitely if people have leaky gut already uh, they need to use uh, all safe means to deal with it and some peptides help there as well like uh, vasa intestinal peptide uh, body protective compound uh, bpc-157 ghk they all help there and uh, that's just a brief mention so people just may have an idea that uh, they can help them uh, themselves a lot fixing the gut and uh, related processes yeah absolutely the gut's so important and with mitochondria yeah yeah and i guess so gut health health. contributes to telomere and mitochondrial health sorry yeah and you mentioned so MOTC, SS31, I know we use for kidney disease, coenzyme Q10, alpha lipoic acid, that all works in with mitochondrial dysfunction. Is there any other nutrients that you like to use when it comes to supporting mitochondrial health? Yes, uh, there is uh, uh, urolithin A, uh, the product mm -hmm. I think is Mito, Mitopure, a very good product. I, I uh, take it personally, I like this effect. And uh, spermidine, this is a uh, this is uh, this is an amino acid that is very vital for telomere health. Uh, sorry, for mitochondrial health. Mm -hmm. I take that one too, spermidine. Perfect. All right, talk to me about nutrient nutrient signaling dysfunction because that's one that obviously has a cross talk that will create senescence, but also senescence will create that. And it's one that people don't talk a lot about. I mean, these top ones people talk about when it comes to aging, but not a lot of people talk about uh, the proteostatic dysfunction and nutrient signaling dysfunction. So first yeah. off, can you help people understand what nutri nutrient signaling dysfunction actually means and what that process happens or what happens in the body with that? So let me start uh, adding something to previous topic of uh, mitochondrial health. Uh, what uh, nutrient dysfunction so obviously nutrient dysfunction will will be manifested by problems with mitochondrial health and uh, for like one of very important nutrients is uh, uh, glutathione and uh, nicotinamide and uh, mm -hmm. they are replenishable either taking precursors uh, like NAC or precursors of uh, for glutathione or precursors of NAD uh, produced by different companies. Uh, so, uh, but uh, here is a, a more complex chain where it's not just uh, this uh, endpoint uh, nutrients, but the entire chain that leads to the uh, normal absorption because uh, our times, most people are able to get good nutrients through uh, nutrition and uh, taking vitamins and supplements, but the question is how well are they absorbed? So it's uh, now more attention is attracted to difference between plasma level of nutrients and intracellular level of certain nutrients. And uh, it's a very interesting question because uh, it's relatively easy to check nutrients level in uh, some blood cells, but uh, uh, how does it get into the tissue cells and organ cells? And good example is uh, gluc uh, insulin uh, sensitivity and glu glucose tolerance. And mm -hmm. uh, so insulin is a hormone that is also a peptide by definition, and it affects uh, uh, certain receptors and channels for uh, penetration of carbohydrate into the cell. And uh, the same way other uh, nutrient related to mechanisms how nutrients get into our cells are working and uh, so many vitamins serve as a cofactors of uh, this process uh, some frequently one electrolyte or one element needs the presence of another uh, to be appropriately absorbed and to be included in the biochemical reactions so but uh, let's get to simple things so nutrient dysfunction uh, the level of clinical level, if someone, let's say, has problems with his or her liver, fatty liver, for example, leaky gut or gastritis or some pro problem uh, with uh, some hematological problems, some anemia, they, all conditions, obviously, anemia leads to, like iron deficient anemia leads to uh, difficulties in delivering uh, oxygen 
uh, to the cells and with all related secondary reactions, lack of oxygen causes changes uh, toward acidosis. Uh, acidotic changes uh, lead to lack of insulin sensitivity, high glucose tolerance, eventually to metabolic syndrome. The same way liver problems lead to lack of or disturbance in bile production or delivery into intestine. And then uh, the whole process of lipid metabolism, the metabolism uh, gets uh, affected and then uh, uh, it leads to, in simple terms, oversimplified to lipid deposition in the endothelium. And uh, of course, if someone already has chronic kidney disease, more lipid deposition and already compromised glomerular uh, vessels will lead to even worse glomerular filtration. So that's how one thing leads to another. So don't disregard anything. Uh, high bilirubin, fatty liver, they all affect kidney eventually. We talk about kidney. Uh, so I'm focused on kidney because our topic is a, uh, we have to remember to, relation between each topic and kidney, and also because it's a good illustration of how uh, one organ affects another and uh, how the related systems are. So for nutrient dysfunction, it's a good idea to check your nutrients level, vitamin level in the plasma, and as much as possible to get a correlation with uh, cellular level of nutrients. Then mm. many people find interesting things there because there is a uh, mismatch because plasma level that can be normal or higher than normal and uh, intracellular level of nutrients that uh, I think would be uh, advice for actionable knowledge that will help people improve their health. And when they see mismatch, then analyze why this mismatch happened and try to cure the conditions, uh, processes that were leading to this mismatch. Yeah, no, that's such a good way of putting it. So, you know, for and it's hard because all the blood testing, if you go to your general practitioner, they're all going to do blood tests. You really need a functional practitioner to be able to know how to do plasma testing. And of course, as what Dr. Grimberg's talking about is if there's a discrepancy between plasma blood or intracellular um, nutrient levels, there's something happening in the transport mechanisms to get stuff inside the cells, which will give you a clue about what's going on with your health so that's what comes down to nutrient dysfunction and whether we need to look at different areas to help certain nutrients cross into certain membranes or into plasma or whether the levels are too high so I think that's you know most testing is very inaccurate when it comes to looking at basic mineral nutrient levels and kidney disease at least that's definitely something I find so always trying to do different types of tests so Okay, so let's move across to proteostatic dysfunction before we come down to my favorite topic, chronic inflammation and stem cell exhaustion. They're a bit more um, straightforward, but what is proteostatic dysfunction and how does that relate to everything else in kidney disease? Uh, so proteostatic comes from two words, uh, pro proteins and stasis. So everyone probably knows homeostasis is a maintenance of a stability in the functions uh, structure and chemistry and physics, everything inside our bodies. And uh, uh, for health, for normal functioning, body has a lot of mechanisms to maintain homeostasis, like maintaining similar level of oxygen or similar uh, uh, pH of blood and other functions that's related to homeostasis. So proteostatics means maintaining the same status of proteins. As I mm. previously mentioned, uh, all uh, disturbances of DNA, uh, telomeres, uh, uh, they eventually lead to translational changes and to synthesis, manufacturing of uh, proteins that are um, uh, pathological. So uh, we have to maintain the production of proteins that are coded in our DNA without any... Um, the, uh, without uh, deviating from uh, uh, this uh, this process. So uh, proteostatic dysfunction, again, it uh, happens for different reasons. Uh, it can be post-translational, post it can be DNA mutation, uh, but also uh, more simple things like uh, um, 
uh, molecules of carbohydrates, uh, they like to join uh, protein molecules uh, to uh, glycosylate them, glycos uh, the process of glycosylation. And uh, uh, this is not a good friendship because frequent mm -hmm. immune system uh, recognizes these glycosylated proteins as a foreign start. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you can guess that it uh, at least increases the risk of autoimmune diseases, but actually it creates mild autoimmune process. And now uh, medical science considers more than 100 uh, previously uh, considered uh, uh, different from autoimmune diseases. Uh, now they consider them uh, as diseases having autoimmune origination, even hypertension, atherosclerosis, and uh, some other conditions that you wouldn't think are related to autoimmunity. So, and that, uh, uh, so uh, this uh, uh, assault on protein molecules, either from carbohydrate, from virus, uh, from uh, um, excessive UV radiation or from medication or from toxins. They all uh, um, change the original appearance of protein molecule. I'm saying appearance because it's what's really important is how this molecule appears to immune cells and they start recognizing it differently. And uh, this leads to uh, many cascades of different things starting from inflammation or autoimmunity, but also to uh, senescence and up eventually apoptosis. Because uh, anything that joins the receptors on the surface of the cell, uh, and uh, usually this, uh, uh, the pr uh, receptors on the surfaces of the cells are made of proteins. Mm -hmm. uh, modifying in the undesirable way these receptors lead to many undesirable conditions. And of course, again, very uh, broadly known process is how the uh, glycosylation in diabetes affects everything from endothelium co causing the peripheral vascul uh, uh, vasculopathy and uh, changes in uh, first in uh, various uh, in the capillaries and then how it affects retina of the eye how it affects coarse kidney and uh, but that's uh, that all stems from uh, changes in proteostatic uh, maintenance and uh, proteostatic dysfunction so i have a question for you dr grimberg and this comes down to a lot of the genetically engineered meat from plant-based proteins that we're starting to see be infiltrated through our diets and People are told to eat uh, vegan, vegetarian, and we've got these highly genetically modified protein plant sources coming in. And my concern is that these artificial genetically modified plant proteins are going to very much accelerate proteostatic dysfunction because we've got a genetically modified protein coming into the body that the body doesn't recognize. And so we're going to dump these um, hybrid damaged proteins into a system that's meant to integrate that into our tissue. And as we know, protein is the building block of life and our immune system and all of those sort of things. And if we're putting in genetically engineered damaged protein into the system, the system can't build off it. We're going to have increased proteostatic dysfunction leading to increased senescence in, in an accelerating aging and chronic disease. Is that a fair logical conclusion to make or am I making things up? Am I worried about nothing? Because this is my big concern about this new type of food. Are you absolutely right? And we share a big concern with you about this. And it's uh, what happens uh, with genetically modified food. Uh, basically, our body is, is designed to uh, recoding enzymes that help to uh, split uh, proteins into smaller molecules to make them digestible. And mm. uh, it's unlikely that we have enzymes to deal with genetically modified proteins. They when, uh, we haven't met them in the process of evolution, they totally knew and that's, again, even for a uh, simple example is uh, uh, for regular food, not genetically modified, how many people uh, suffer from gluten? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the same thing happens when uh, people meet 
uh, genetically modified, uh, I would say, proteins, because it's, uh, we're talking about uh, pro protostatic dysfunction. So uh, these proteins are not properly digested, not uh, not getting split into amino acids. So uh, huge uh, pieces of the molecule, so entire molecule can get uh, uh, with gradual damage and developing uh, a less tight junction between intestinal cells. Uh, mm -hmm. There is that this uh, huge uh, pieces of molecules. So molecules, molecules themselves can get into the blood uh, stream and uh, will be uh, uh, they are uh, most dangerous antigens. Then it's by definition antigens uh, all proteins and yeah. this protein is. Uh, unknown and uh, unexpected by the body. So definitely I consider this as a huge risk. And uh, this is just one risk that we just discussed, but how many risks can be unknown? Yeah, no, thank you for talking to that. That's always been my worry with that sort of stuff. And as you said, gluten, it's one of the reasons if you've got food allergies that will damage the uh, gut lining. So you're getting unprocessed um, antigens and protein chains crossing into the bloodstream too early. As Dr. Greenberg mentioned, the immune system is going to see that as foreign and attack it. So um, definitely food allergens, anything uh, like that you want to stay away from if you've got kidney disease, especially an autoimmune based kidney disease like lupus and things like that. So Okay, let's come down to stem cell exhaustion. Talk to me about what that means and how that relates to chronic kidney disease and aging. That's a beautiful term, stem cells exhaustion. And, uh, but, it's very uh, bright. They're exhausted. <laughs> but uh, it does happen and it happens with a different rate for different lines of stem cells and also depends on... Um, probably everything that we earlier discussed today. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, interesting working with uh, uh, cell medicine and asking these questions, scientists, uh, we find different things. For example, uh, when people harvest someone's bone marrow stem cells, uh, the, uh, if the person is like say middle age, uh, these stem cells may be pretty exhausted. And what does it mean in the scientific term stem cell exhaustion? It also means shorter telomeres. Yeah. Obviously, uh, when you get stem cell treatment, you want, uh, with, let's say you proliferated your own stem cells and you want to transfuse them. Obviously, you want to uh, repopulate your body with the telomere lengths that at least the same as other cells in your body, but preferably a little longer. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and uh, uh, so what happens if uh, uh, someone's, uh, someone is middle age, uh, the bone marrow has uh, hematopoietic stem cells. These stem cells are precursors of all other blood cells. And we know that blood cells have relatively short lifespan, like from a few weeks to a few months. Yeah. Uh, so, so we, uh, for this reason, these hematopoietic stem cells have to uh, be in very frequent division to maintain the population, to maintain the population of the, uh, of the cells they eventually differentiate, differentiate to. Uh, that means uh, circulating blood cells. So uh, going through so many divisions, no wonder they have uh, shorter telomeres that say stem cells from the fat tissue, where mm -hmm. usually even if people do intermediate passing, they, uh, the cells there divide very rarely. And if, only if people have extreme fasting and uh, extreme changes in their weight, they uh, divide uh, uh, by the age of 50 or 60, maybe only a few times. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, so research shows that they have much longer telomeres than uh, hematopoietic stem cells and, and many other cells and for this reason they good for retransfusion and autologous uh, fat tissue derived stem cells seem to be good means and safe means of cell therapy but uh, there are also other markers of uh, stem cell exhaustion uh, the CD receptors on the surface uh, 
probably undergo a certain dynamic where uh, well, that uh, helps scientists to determine which of them are less viable and have less potential to turn into something uh, useful and regenerative in the human body. Mm -hmm. And definitely uh, all the factors that we mentioned, like diabetes and related protein glycosylation uh, uh, affect the uh, how stem cells maintain their health and avoid exhaustion. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, definitely stem cells need strong and functional mitochondria. Overall, mm -hmm. uh, telomere lengths and factors that affect telomere lengths, of course, uh, stem cells are also part of the, of the body. They're not immune to attacks and assaults on the body we get from either bad lifestyle uh, habits or radiation, etc. They all suffer uh, the same damage that manifests as stem cell exhaustion or even decrease of their population. As, uh, no, as everyone has different uh, amount of stem cells, let's say, per one cc of his or her blood. It's mm -hmm. also to understand so and of course nutrient dysfunction deficiencies and inflammation and uh, um, inflammation actually that we'll discuss next is very uh, main, uh, chronic inflammation and uh, related um, cascades of uh, physiological reactions are very important and they are not f friendly and not supportive of having healthy stem cells no, they are certainly not. And with stem cell exhaustion, obviously, I mean, if we look at this diagram, we can see that, as we mentioned, you know, epigenetic factors, telomere erosion, DNA damage, mitochondrial dysfunction leads to senescence. Senescence leads to nutrient dysfunction, proteostatic dysfunction, and they feed back into senescence. And then senescence will lead to stem cell exhaustion and chronic inflammation. So all of these things are super important to make sure that our stem cells aren't exhausting. And you mentioned intermittent fasting. That's something that I've seen that makes a big difference when it comes to stem cell health and things like that. But is there anything else, apart from obviously working on these top areas, is there anything else that you've noticed will make a big difference with stem cell health? Yes, and also talking about senescence, obviously the higher burden of senescent or mutated cells in the body affects yeah. Uh, it's kind of uh, interference with normal function of uh, bone marrow. It uh, produces a lot of endotoxins and also kind of distracts, uh, in simple terms, it distracts resources of the body on dealing with senescent cells uh, versus maintaining and uh, supporting its stem cell population. Mm. Yeah, senescence is such a, it's funny, like in Australia, it's not something a lot of people are talking about. I'm doing a big lecture tomorrow on it when it comes to diseases and aging and senescence. We now know to play such a major role, just the whole fact that you can take senescent cells out of an aged rat, inject it into a young rat, and that rat will get exactly the same diseases of aging within a week as the old rats so you know that senescent zombie cells sort of thing so that big load of senescent cells I think is a big key factor to reducing a lot of these chronic um, diseases and slowing down aging and helping with longevity and of course these things feed into that and then if we can improve senescence load we're going to improve these bottom four um, areas as you spoke about. So a few words on this so a few simple advices like uh, some oriental medicine plant derived icarine supplement is improving production of your own stem cells. There are certain algae, algae uh, marine products that mm -hmm. uh, help uh, to improve production of stem cells. Hyperbaric, hyperbaric uh, procedures improve stem cell uh, yep. production. And uh, actually, I'm asking sci scientists that I'm working with to do simple ass assays where we measure. Uh, how we can affect stem cell exhaustion and their functions and the receptors uh, 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 incubating them with certain peptides or subjecting them to certain physical conditions or uh, to see what affects them and how we can measure it and uh, direct it. And I just read a study that pure dark chocolate cacao actually stimulates stem cell production. I was very excited to read that study. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm always up for eating good quality dark chocolate. <laughs> And, okay. and for senescence, and for senescence, for senescence yes. there are some simple supplements, uh, some, uh, I think, uh, plant products related to tea tree. Uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, I don't mean tea tree oil, but uh, uh, Camellia sinensis derived products and certain alkaloids that uh, help to reduce senescent load. Mm -hmm. and, de and definitely in this aspect, different forms of fasting. Uh, probably hip, hypoxic uh, high altitude uh, imitating training can be very contributive to reduce senescence. And now there is a growing field of diets mimicking uh, fasting. That's also very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The prolo, um, prolo um, therapy, that's low, carb, um, low calorie intake that mimics fasting. They've had some really good results with senescence. And then probably peptides like, you know, like my go-to peptide for senescence is FOXO4. Um, is that one you would go for? Is there any other? Yes, I mean, FOX slash DRI. And yeah. Uh, not just, there are a few of them, but the one is the four is the most studied. Yes, definitely. I've been using it and I see very good results. There are, yeah. specifics I, there are some specifics of using these peptides and combining it with other peptides. But in general, idea is that... Uh, 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 there is not only cellular senescence, but senescence of the organelles and organoids. And senescence of mitochondria is expressed by mitochondria not being able to eat themselves. So, uh, uh, so the process of what's called auto autophagy, or how mitochondria eat themselves, is uh, uh, is not as efficient as it should be. And mm. uh, that's why this uh, supplement MetaPure helping this in this process, for example. And yeah. MOTSC also helps in uh, how this old, all the mitochondria self digest and give the way to younger mitochondria. And uh, mitochondria are very interesting organisms. They actually, uh, in the past, they were separate from humans. They were bacteria that yeah. created symbiotic relations with uh, uh, humans and live inside the cells. And they have different genome. It's uh, like a ring. They have a small number of genes, but they are their own genes. They are pretty they, autonomous beings. They are fascinating. And we only get our mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. That doesn't come from our fathers, right? That just passes down through that that line. So I find that whole, but you're right, mitochondria are fascinating. So if anyone missed that, they used to be bacteria and separate from us. And now they sit as an organelle inside and powerhouse all our ourselves we can't live without mitochondria but yeah they're super interesting organelles and just how they evolved alongside humans and what they do i i find that whole thing almost like we kept, we were birth, all ourselves sort of birthed around mitochondria in a sense it's it's really fascinating okay last but not least and the big one that i think i'm yet to come across a patient with a chronic disease that doesn't have some sort of degree of this and that is chronic inflammation um, and obviously chronic inflammation being in this diagram as an end result of senescence. Um, so talk to me about chronic inflammation and its role in chronic disease, because it was maybe 10 years ago where everyone was like, well, all chronic disease is just in an inflammatory based disease. Obviously, we know it's a lot more than that. It's related to all of these things in senescence. But inflammation has been very well um, accepted and studied as part of the conglomerate of uh, diseases of aging and aging and all those sort of things. So talk to me about inflammation and its role in kidney disease and everything else. Uh, so first, uh, inf uh, unfortunately, inflammation uh, was uh, demonized as a bad process while uh, mo most of the time it saves us, saves our lives. So it's a yeah. basic mechanism how our body protects us from uh, uh, foreign intruders. And uh, so this process that combines a very coordinated response from immune system, from uh, uh, vascular, uh, uh, neurovascular response, and even certain endocrine response, uh, this, uh, 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 this process, uh, uh, while uh, being very helpful and protective uh, against uh, um, say uh, 
bacteria or viral or fungal or any other uh, invaders that come from outside. At the same time, uh, when the, the factors that work uh, during the formation persist and stay active in the body, they become very uh, damaging for the body and not only locally, but uh, across uh, uh, all, uh, all organs, tissues and cells. Mm. And, uh, so for uh, for uh, convenience of the explanation, uh, when inflammation happens, there are a lot of uh, signaling between the cells. Cells need to communicate fast and actively, and for this they use molecule cytokines, uh, among many other. other. But uh, cytokines are very strong, very biologically active molecules. Probably many people heard about them during uh, COVID pandemic when uh, they found out that the cytokine storm was responsible for rapid deterioration and overwhelming pneumonia and even death of people. Uh, that's why inflammatory cytokines are so active that uh, they can affect uh, actually any system and any cell in the body. They uh, uh, create uh, many secondary reactions and are very remote from them. Cells, for example, inflammation in, uh, in the knee can uh, create the production of uh, cytokines that eventually will make blood-brain barrier more penetrable for uh, things that are not supposed to go there, including uh, microbial organisms and, uh, or some other inflammatory molecules, other cytokines that uh, create inflammation inside the central nervous system that called neuroinflammaging. And in the same way, uh, they can affect uh, um, glucose, uh, insulin uh, sensitivity and glucose tolerance because for acute inflammation, uh, the body needs one thing, but uh, when uh, this inflammatory uh, signaling molecules start uh, pretending that uh, there is still state of the war, uh, they deprive all other cells and uh, organs from vitally necessary substances. And they still in war and they consume everything and they uh, block all other cells from all normal process to create condition of uh, agitation and uh, abnormal functioning. It's false alarm. Uh, yeah. It's very taxing on mitochondria, actually. All these inflammation-related cytokines, they affect receptors on the surface of the cells, some information in forms of uh, peptides. In this case, unnecessary peptides gets inside the cells. Organelles affect how mitochondria function, energy production, lipid peroxidation. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the level of physiological response, it leads to loss of metabolic flexibility. And mm -hmm. uh, I want to mention and bring this term because uh, in simple terms, when you're hungry and instead of uh, uh, wanting to eat a chicken breast and broccoli, uh, you crave for uh, tiramisu or chocolate cake, it means <laughs> uh, your cells want uh, easy fuel. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but uh, if you crave, let's say, for um, uh, for some health uh, for some healthy food, for some healthy fats, it means your cells have time and uh, energy enough to digest uh, more uh, healthy, healthy and as frequently more difficult to metabolize product. And when the cells, uh, not only stem cells, but uh, many other cells, exhausted and uh, in the state of emergency claimed by inflammatory cytokines, they just need first uh, and fast fuel, just uh, carbohydrate and junk food. Mm. And then uh, if people uh, follow this uh, craving, they get more junk, more endotoxins, they block uh, their normal signaling even more and it sustains inflammatory cascades and and then uh, there are so many unwanted uh, reactions affecting this M 
mTOR, mTOR receptor, and uh, that is a target for longevity-related research. But so many of them uh, get activated, cascades leading to apoptosis, cascades uh, leading to uh, uh, changes in uh, protostasis, and, uh, uh, and also eventually cascades leading to normal maintaining of telomere links and uh, restoring their length. So everything gets affected. And for, yeah. kid for kidney condition, there is a clear parallel. People who have secondary kidney problems, secondary to diabetes, they know well, they violate their diet, they see changes in their creatinine and drop in EGFR. Mm -hmm. well, they know and they tell me uh, that they know that they just uh, 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 had this little sin eating the cake or drinking a little bit on Thursday or some part. Yeah. But that's uh, that's simple example how clinically you see manifestation of this deep and scientifically described uh, processes. Yeah, and I think it's really important that, you know, we understand that, you know, longevity medicine, and you're at the forefront of this, so please feel free to speak to this if I butcher it, but longevity medicine is really coming a long way at the moment, and people like Brian Johnson and all of those sort of people that are doing lots of experiments and trying different things, we're starting to have more conversations about stem cell exhaustion and protostatic dysfunction and um, how we can improve DNA and telomere length and people are starting to get into this sort of stuff. And of course, for me, I go the longevity field also is going to cross over into the chronic disease field because all of those things that people are spending a lot of money on researching when it comes to longevity hold the key in potentially reversing and protecting us from a lot of the chronic common diseases that we're seeing, you know, pop up everywhere. I think, you know, the amount of people with chronic kidney disease is, you know, mind boggling. So with what you see and, you know, you get to see what's coming down the pipeline with future medicine. I know you said to me, we were catching up privately a couple of weeks ago where you said sort of in 10 years time, most chronic conditions will have a treatment or be far more successfully treated. What are you seeing to say those sort of things when it comes to the longevity medical field and chronic disease and these processes of aging? Uh, well, I feel very optimistic about uh, longevity, longevity field and also about the field of uh, helping people with many chronic diseases. And talking about chronic kidney diseases, it's a huge number of people struggling with this condition. And many people are undiagnosed because they don't test frequently, and it, unfortunately, it's uh, very silent, and it frequently goes undiagnosed. For this, mm -hmm. first, I wanted to comment, for example, uh, Mr. Brian Johnson, is he's doing a very good job on uh, monitoring his many of his parameters, and I think uh, I would love to see this data analyzed with artificial intelligence to see uh, low statistic, uh, statistic probability traits that can be done actually for more and more patients. And when we were talking about uh, uh, nutrients, there are more and more special labs and even wearable devices that probably in the next few years will uh, let you to see your uh, kidney function parameters as well as many nutrients, uh, non-invasive wearable technology. That would be very important because probably uh, I realistically expect that within a few years, this all data coming from this wearable technology will be analyzed with AI and will help people to see a low probability traits and tendencies in their bodies. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, currently people are uh, usually, if they healthy or relatively healthy, see doctor or have blood work at the best once or twice a year. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very cross-sectional. It's not longitudinal uh, analysis, so we don't see what happens to people on a day-by-day basis. And uh, for people with uh, chronic conditions, chronic kidney conditions, this improving, even without uh, getting into deep fantasy, just improving monitoring what affects the creatinine level, DUN, uh, potassium, phosphorus level, and a being able to monitor and maintain uh, its a, a good level will be a good con a contribution to maintain kidney health. Second, uh, of course, developing of cell medicine and reprogramming uh, people, autologous stem cells, uh, mm. 
with the enormous help. Uh, I'm sure within uh, probably within 10 years, we'll see organs cloned from people on t uh, cells and where uh, the concern of uh, uh, transplant host conflict will be resolved and it would be great help, particularly for people with kidney problems where many people are waiting for kidney transplant mm. about them. And uh, I think they will get a good help. Uh, next, uh, other areas of cell medicine, exosomes and programmed lines of stem cells probably will help people who have mild or moderate uh, degree of chronic kidney disease to improve the glomerular function and to uh, improve some intracellular processing. And uh, I, uh, even today in my patients, I see good results applying uh, uh, certain peptides and their combination depending on specifics of uh, this patient's kidney pathology and the comorbid conditions with very good results. And uh, we see very significant improvement in all uh, kidney testing and uh, also subjectively experience reversal of uh, like, uh, feeling of well-being and uh, usefulness. It's very mm -hmm. and uh, And uh, I think this field are developing so fast and uh, they will help one one field will help another field like computational science will help to uh, create better algorithms for use of peptides and lines of stem cells. And it will help to uh, rapidly create uh, nanotechnology will help to clone tissue and organs and in combination with cell medicine. So I think uh, the way they develop, it's very fast and accelerating. So I think 10 years we'll see miraculous results. Lots of things to be optimistic about and look forward to when it comes to medicine. And, and as I said, I think it's the longevity field that is really making a lot of this possible because people are putting so much money into it. And, you know, lots of people don't like AI, but the advent of AI makes studying a lot of these things, especially when it comes to genetics and the way that peptides will change and a gene expression. Really, we need AI to be able to help uh, understand all of that and how to best use sort of things. So lots of exciting things coming down the pipeline in the next 10 years. And we're very lucky to have you, Dr. Grimberg, on the cutting edge of it. And I know you're exposed to a lot of this stuff and because it's your interest and the work that you've done with governments and all of those sort of things, it's what you do to really bring this stuff out and accelerate. So glad to have you as part of our team where we can check in and see what's coming down the pipeline as far as treatments go. Is there Anything else you wanted to add or say when it comes to uh, aging and chronic disease and kidney disease? Anything you, we missed or you wanted to add before we wrap up? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. It is my pleasure to share this, uh, say, advances in the science and what we can do. And I wish and hope that it will help people to get some actionable knowledge and improve their health. And uh, uh, we discussed most of things that happened, just uh, probably uh, just to mention there is developing field of gene therapeutics, and this is also very promising. And while in the past it was slowed down by uh, lack of uh, probably good means to verify results, now it uh, regains the power and probably soon we will see a number of uh, uh, individual gene designed uh, gene therapeutics that will also contribute into alleviating some less frequent kidney condition specific forms of nephritis and nephropathies. So it's amazing. Very exciting times to be alive. So again, thank you for your expertise. If anyone wants to contact Dr. Grimberg and work with him one-on-one, -on -one, um, whether it be kidney disease, especially um, integrating peptide medicine into your regime. I know I've used him personally for that. Um, I'll put Dr. Grimberg's details below. He works out of San Francisco and is available to do, you do telehealth and Skype consults with people all around the country. So, and as well in different countries because he's working with some of my cancer patients. So again, Dr. Grimberg, thank you so much for your knowledge and expertise. It is always a privilege and an honor to have someone as esteemed as you on our channel sharing your wealth of information. If you want to know more about what we do, head to www.kidneycoach.com. 
Uh, you'll find us on Instagram and Facebook under the same name. Remember to hit subscribe and like it. That way you will be uh, notified anytime we put up new videos. And if there's any topic that you want Dr. Grimberg to talk about, or if you have any questions about this podcast, please put them in the notes below and we will be sure to answer them. Thanks again for being part of our community. Dr. Grimberg, thank you again for your time. And I look forward to seeing you all next time. Bye. Bye.